Good evening, everyone. My name is Monica Brott, and I'm the president of Inclusion Alberta. Welcome. We'll start with a land acknowledgement. Inclusion Alberta acknowledges that we call out what we call Alberta is on the traditional and ancestral territory of many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations, presently subject to Treaty 6, 7, and 8, namely the Blackfoot Confederacy, Kainai, Kikini, and Siksika, the Cree, Diné, Saltu, Nakota Sioux, Sony Nakota, and Sutina Nation, and the Métis people of Alberta. This includes the Métis settlements and the six regions of the Métis Nation of Alberta within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we live, work, and gather on. Welcome to our Provincial Election Forum. Inclusion Alberta is pleased to provide voters across the province with this opportunity to hear directly from candidates answering your questions about issues of importance to individuals with developmental disabilities and their families. Thank you for engaging in the political process. By speaking up about the issues that matter to you, by learning about where the candidates and parties stand, and by voting, each of you is helping to make this a better province for everyone. For over 60 years, Inclusion Alberta has been advocating on behalf of children and adults with developmental disabilities and their families. Any progress we have made in Alberta towards inclusion for individuals with developmental disabilities and their families has come because of the grassroots movement that is working to realize the dream of children and adults with developmental disabilities being valued, participating, and welcomed community members. Thank you to the candidates who have taken time away from their extremely busy campaigns to be with us tonight. While this may be time away from knocking on doors in your riding, I expect that each of you will find that voters in your own riding are wanting to talk with you about some of the same questions being discussed tonight. Now I'd like to introduce Trish Bowman, Inclusion Alberta CEO. There was a little technical difficulty just to get us off on the right foot. Couldn't unmute myself. So <laughs> thank you all very much. Uh, what, what would a virtual forum be without a technical glitch? Um, thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Um, I see lots of familiar names and faces and lots that I don't recognize. So it's really wonderful to have so much of, so many of you joining us tonight. The uh, 2019 provincial election campaign was the first time that a major political party featured substantive commitments to people with disabilities in their election platform. Even though the current provincial government delivered on some of those commitments during the past four years, Inclusion Alberta is getting calls and emails from a higher number of Albertans than ever before who are in need of our advocacy because of the challenges being presented to them, receiving the supports and services they require. Because of an increasingly large number of individuals with developmental disabilities in their families are in or on the verge of crisis, Inclusion Alberta is compelled to call on political parties and candidates to commit to the policy and funding changes that are needed. During the current election campaign, both parties have highlighted affordability measures and increases to age benefits. While these have a real impact in addressing the poverty that disproportionately impacts people with disabilities, both parties have yet to commit to addressing a range of other issues which are presenting tremendous challenges to children and adults with developmental disabilities and their families to live good lives fully included in all that Alberta has to offer. For instance, consecutive provincial governments have been unwilling to hold school districts accountable to, hold, to honor the choice of parents for an inclusive education where their children are welcomed and supported in the regular education classroom with their same age non-disabled peers. In the absence of leadership and accountability from the province, access to a quality inclusive education has become even more difficult to achieve and often requires more advocacy on the part of parents now than 10 years ago. The use of seclusion and restraint persists and appears to be increasing in some Alberta schools, and the province has no plan to hold districts accountable, support them to develop alternative positive approaches for students experiencing challenges, and eliminate the use of these traumatic and harmful practices. 
First Nation adults cannot receive PDB supports on reserve, so they can only access needed supports and services by leaving their communities, homes, and families. Not only has the government of Alberta continued operating institutions for people with developmental disabilities that have existed for decades, but it's also funding larger congregate facilities and new institutions. The allocation of resources to institutions rather than to supporting people to live in community is a threat to every person with a developmental disability who struggles to access the supports they need to live in community. Individuals and families live in fear of being told that the only support they'll be offered will be in congregate facilities and institutions. In the midst of the current housing crisis, the government has provided capital to build a new institution in Calgary, but it has no plans to meet the needs of people with developmental disabilities to access inclusive, affordable housing and the supports to live and participate in community life. The first wage increase since 2014 has not adequately addressed the fact that for both service providers and families hiring through individualized funding, funding remains inadequate to recruit, train and retain good staff. The FSCD and PDD programs have eroded significantly over the past decade and are failing children and adults with developmental disabilities and their families. While the government has announced plans to begin offering PDD supports to the approximately 800 adults on the wait list, this list only includes those deemed to have needs that are critical or urgent. The government has not announced any plan to address the further 1400 adults on the misleadingly named service planning list who are without the PDD supports they require with lives placed on indefinite hold. Between PDD and FSCD, according to the last available data, over 5,300 Albertan children and adults with disabilities are without any disability re related supports with those receiving inadequate supports far exceeding this number. This number is expected to continue to grow uh, given the current FSCD and PDD budgets. The lack of support for and barriers to employment for adults with developmental disabilities and parents who have children with dis developmental disabilities perpetuates persistent poverty. Every single one of these issues is nonpartisan. These are not ideological issues. They impact individuals and families in every region of our province from every background and from every income level. Even though to date neither party has spoken to these issues, the attendance of candidates at this forum suggests a commitment to talking about these issues with individuals with developmental disabilities and their families, and an awareness that government needs to do better. I remain hopeful that in this forum tonight and in the coming weeks, we'll see candidates and parties make clear commitments to making life better for individuals with developmental disabilities and their families. Thank you to all of the individuals and families who submitted questions for the candidates tonight and to the greater number who continue to speak up about these issues with candidates in their local writings. Each of you can be part of making change by speaking up and voting. Information about the issues I've described and about how to raise your voice with candidates is available on Inclusion Alberta's website. I'm going to pass it over now to Philip May, our Director of Community Engagement and Pub Public Affairs to get the forum started. Thank you, Trish. We're very pleased to have six candidates attending this event from different regions of Alberta. Inclusion Alberta emailed invitations to the two major parties and to every one of their candidates for whom we could find contact information when our invites were sent on April 26th. We were pleased to have a UCP candidate agree to attend the event. Unfortunately, the candidate withdrew their participation at the last minute due to another meeting they were required at. Even though no UCP candidate is attending tonight, Inclusion Alberta did provide the party the opportunity to submit written responses to the 10 questions that will be asked tonight. We have received written responses from the UCP and the moderator will be reading these questions throughout the course of our evening. Now I'm very pleased to introduce Steve Hogel as the moderator for our event. Steve's professional experience includes running the CTV Edmonton Newsroom, Vice President Communications at Public of, of Public Affairs, or of Communications and Public Affairs at the Alberta Research Council, Vice President Communications and Broadcast at the Edmonton Oilers, go Oilers go, President of the Saskatoon Blades and General Manager of Hockey Edmonton. Now I will turn things over to Steve and thank you very much. 
Thanks very much, Philip, and uh, the previous speakers. I certainly uh, agree with a lot of the comments in terms of uh, applauding, first of all, Inclusion Alberta for staging this. I think uh, it, it's an important uh, piece of engagement on the political campaign trail. Uh, I, I applaud anybody who puts their name forward for public office, uh, those successful and those unsuccessful. I think that's a huge commitment and, and props all the way around. And the participants, as Trish mentioned, without the participants and those lobbying efforts, change would not happen. And so uh, really, really cool to see this in action. And I'm really looking forward to uh, learning a lot tonight and doing so in a professional manner. And you know, the wildfires were absolutely tragic, but one of the best things I saw stemming from them were the two political leaders uh, working hand in hand over at the Expo Center uh, for the people of Alberta. And I think we can take that spirit forward tonight uh, as we learn and uh, where we are at and what still needs to be done. With those thoughts in mind, uh, appreciate uh, you having me again. And the rules for the forum are as follows. I'll go through these quickly so we can hear from the people who matter, the candidates. The rules, number one, you are welcome to state in the chat room your name, where you are from, but the chat will be closed for the rest of the meeting once the candidates begin speaking. Neither candidates nor the audience are permitted to display campaign materials, including campaign buttons, shirts, hats, logos, banners, etc. You are encouraged to have your camera on, but any offensive visual material or behavior will not be tolerated. Questions were pre-submitted by the public, Inclusion Alberta, and then select, sorry, by the public, and then Inclusion Alberta selected 10 questions that align with five themes that individuals with developmental disabilities, their families and allies are speaking up about during this election campaign. The list of questions was provided to the candidates four days ago, and I will read some questions and others will be read by the person who submitted the question. Relevant questions submitted by the public that were not asked during the forum will be shared with candidates so they can provide written responses should they choose to. Inclusion Alberta will post any written responses it receives. Inclusion Alberta will post the entire unedited recording. Unauthorized recording is prohibited. The forum will begin with an opening statement from each candidate, then proceed to questions and answers. Each party was invited to designate which of their candidates would answer each question during the two minute response time. After the questions are complete, each candidate will deliver a closing statement. Responses will alternate between the two parties answering first and second. Time limits will be strictly enforced by muting the mic when time expires. Now, as Philip mentioned, we are pleased to have six candidates attending this forum. And in random order, I am going to introduce them, invite them one at a time to make a two minute opening statement or just to introduce themselves. And we are going to begin with Luann Metz from Calgary Varsity. Hello, um, thank you very much for including me today. I am excited uh, to learn more about uh, Inclusion Alberta. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about me so you, uh, you know my background. Um, I'm a professor. We seem to be having some audio challenges there. Uh, Luann, could you check your mute button? My mute button says I am unmuted. And seeing she's frozen, we'll come back to her, but we will begin... Oh. Well, other people can hear her apparently. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we've got in the chat room, we can hear her here. So hmm. if Luann is unfrozen, carry on Luann, I can't hear you, but others can. So sorry, please continue. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I, I need that uh, rural internet that we want to promise. My internet in the city is not very good either sometimes. Um, so I'm a neurologist, and I am a professor in the Department of Clinical Neurosciences at the University of Calgary. Um, well, am I muted still? No, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, and so my area of mo clinical practice, as well as my research, has been mostly in the area of multiple sclerosis. So I have experience uh, for about 35 years 
uh, in dealing with people with a wide range of disabilities. And as a neurologist, seeing many adults, young adults um, in hospital when they're in crisis with a variety of disabilities, including developmental disabilities. Um, but I'm really not an expert in, um, in education or really in many of the problems specific to developmental disabilities, and I'm very anxious to hear more. Um, I founded a group called Eyes Forward Alberta, an advocacy group to create and fight for public health care um, when the UCP were moving us towards privatized American-style health care. And I'm really running in this election because I believe that you and your children deserve better, better health care, better social supports, better education, and more affordable housing. We really need a better and very inclusive future. Um, I never planned to run for public office. But um, when Jason Kenney became premier, I was stimulated by the changes to do what I can do to try and make this a, a better place to live. I'm really upset about the UCP's cruelty and lack of caring for people um, and their superior entitled attitude, as well as a lot of the regressive leg legislation and cuts to services that have happened. The UCP laid off 20,000 educational support staff in the middle of a pandemic, and these layoffs came just two weeks after they promised not to. The layoff notice was served on Twitter. They slashed funding to Puff for vulnerable students, at, which made many of your lives more challenging and harder for your children. So the cruel, backwards, incompetent, and disrespectful changes that have been happening are things that I'm moving into politics to try and fight. Uh, that's why I joined Rachel's team, because we need a better leader and we need the better team that we're going to be bringing um, forward. I'm committed to the Accessibility and Inclusion Act, Inclusion Act, which the NDP are promising to bring in. The Act will recognize accessibility as a human right and will hold government accountable to ensuring a comprehensive approach to disability and inclusion. We're committed to indexing AISH and income supports because Alberta needs to be barrier free. I'm looking forward to learning more from you about the special challenges faced by individuals with developmental disabilities, and of course, you, their families, and in sharing more about some of our plans. Thank you. Thanks, Luann, and thanks for your persistence. And my apologies for the technical issues here at headquarters. Uh, next up, also from Calgary, Calgary Southeast, Justin Hughesby. Justin? Hi, everyone. Um, so just want to say thank you uh, to Inclusion Alberta for including me. I'm, I'm a bit of a last uh, a, a last moment uh, attendee here today. So um, I, and thank you, Luann, my, my colleague out of Calgary Varsity for uh, um, uh, for her eloquent description. I am the candidate for Calgary uh, Southeast. Um, I uh, actually work out of the University of Calgary and, um, and to be honest with you, uh, I'm kind of been quite on, on the front lines of um, with the Alberta Union for Provincial Employees in terms of uh, attempting to stop privatization of the services uh, for uh, uh, PDD that uh, was, uh, was experienced uh, uh, back in, uh, in June of 2020. Um, my uh, Specific uh, area of interest is really about caring for folks. Uh, I do a lot of outreach for vulnerable Calgarians, houseless Calgarians down in um, down in uh, our downtown core, uh, trying to help people access services that uh, they don't necessarily have and the resources uh, that may not be available to them, um, and really trying to connect folks with that. And so, um, inclusion and accessibility is is a big uh, is a is a big thing uh, in terms of uh, you know what I believe in and in terms of uh, also what I do as part of my work in, in capital construction as well. Um, I also, in our family here, we've uh, been born witness to the front line of the cuts to uh, Puff, for instance, and, and the lack of uh, additional supports. Uh, uh, for, you know, for example, EAs in the classrooms to sort of help uh, foster that, that thriving environment that we all know that we, we can uh, have and, and all 
all children uh, deserve, uh, uh, in addition to uh, helping in households supports that, uh, that, that, that all persons with uh, um, developmental disabilities in Alberta, uh, making sure they have access to those resources. Uh, uh, Luann has already spoken about the indexing of Asian and other supports there, uh, but uh, I'm very, very grateful to be here today. Thank you, Philip, for uh, allowing me to kind of join on last second, and I'm interested to learn uh, what, what else uh, can be had. So I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much. Justin, thanks very much, and I uh, appreciate the time. Uh, just a reminder for the two-minute time limit for the opening remarks. We now have Marie Renault from St. Albert. Marie? Can you hear me? Yes, good. Well, hello everyone. It's lovely to see you. It's, it was fun looking at the chat and seeing uh, names that I recognize from all over Alberta. It's awesome to see you. As always, I'm incredibly grateful for the advocacy work of Inclusion Alberta and all the chapters around the province. Um, I'm not going to tell you for how many decades I've been watching them uh, do their work and push boundaries and develop new ideas and push those ideas. It's been a while, but I'm, I am grateful for their work. Um, you know, I've been in opposition now for four years, and I can tell you that that experience in opposition has been invaluable to me. I think I've been I've been involved in, in some capacity in the disability sector for much of my adult life, but being a, an opposition MLA gave me unique insight into um, particularly social services, as I was the critic for that particular area, and included in there, of course, is PDD and FSCD, and all of those supports, income supports that we rely on or that people with disabilities rely on. And what I learned um, over that, I learned a lot of things over that four years, but what I learned over that four years is that we need a foundation from which to work from. And so instead of sort of one-off projects or one-off needs that we were funding, we really needed to come together to establish a foundation of where we wanted to be if we wanted to truly be an accessible and an inclusive province. And so recognizing we were one of only a couple of provinces without that legislation, we spent a lot of time talking about it and you know, an NDP government would absolutely commit to consulting on and creating that kind of legislation that would move things beyond just the built environment and communication and procurement and transportation to employment and service delivery. And so I'm super excited that this will be an all of government approach to addressing inclusion and accessibility, which is really the foundation, I think, of what we're talking about tonight. So I agree, there's a lot of need out there and I, I look forward to hearing all the answers uh, to the questions that are coming. So thank you very much. Thanks, Marie. Next up, Catherine Swampy from Masquachi, Swatasquin. Thank you. Uh, because I'm in an area where our internet is not that great, and if I was to un, um, or if I was to activate my video so everyone could see me, I would not be heard. So I'm going to leave my video off. I'm going to ask for everybody's forgiveness for that. Uh, so my name is Catherine Swampy. I am a counselor for the Samson Cree Nation, and I, I, I've had just about enough of, um, I guess, the oppression and the struggles that we're going through with the government. And I have decided that I would uh, jump into the realm of, of running for the province. And when it comes to this area, I, I am a mother. I have raised numerous children and including in those children um, are some age, age recipients. They have since moved off and, and are living off reserve. They cannot live at home, although they do need the extra supports. Um, they're just non-existent when it comes to on reserve PDD. Uh, all of these resources just don't exist or else they don't apply when you live on reserve. So I'm here to bring a voice to some of our, our most vulnerable sector of people that live here within uh, Musquachie, Swatasquin. Uh, as well, as, well, a lot of the riding is not on reserve, but it, it's still very felt within Indigenous communities. So I'm here to be that voice. Thank you. Catherine, thank you for that insight. We're going to head a little further north to Grand Prairie to hear from Kevin McLean. Uh, 
Uh, I think you can hear me. I'm unmuted. Thank you for uh, including me in the Clues in Alberta. I look forward to this. I look forward to learning. Um, in my community, like every other community, we have people that have development disabilities. I bowl with uh, an individual who's on the orders, Doug Eady, that was brought out there because some Facebook issues and that. And he is an all-star in our community and he's a buddy of mine. And we are on the same bowling team. And before I bowl, they bowl before me. I don't know how they do it, but three of them, they bowl in the Special Olympics. So, um, and there's about 60 people there. Um, but I notice the big individuals is the families that are the parents that have to do so much work. So it means a lot to me in this. So another thing I want to say is a couple things from Grand Prairie. We're so far north. We have a new hospital. We don't have the doctors to help in a lot of different issues. So a lot of the families here have to travel to Edmonton or maybe Calgary. And you're looking at different expenses. Um, that's been brought to my attention. I've seen it with uh, not only a family member, but also friends and how we can uh, look at that better. But one of the big things here too, is I heard about the school system, but it's for the whole school. Um, like you heard, we have 735,000 students after 2019, and now we got 770,000, 35,000 more students, less teachers. The overall school system for all kids is hurting and suffering, and we have to do a lot better and step up. Um, what, what else can I say? Um, some of the equipment, unsafe equipment I've been told about with, uh, for the kids needs to be changed. Um, there's, there's quite a bit I like to, to say here, but and some good things are working good, they tell me, is respite is a good, good program that's helping out in some areas. And uh, so I'm here to listen and find out more. Uh, it means a lot to me. And uh, thank you for having me. Thanks very much, Kevin. We are now heading to Edmonton Rutherford and Jody Callahoo Stonehouse. Tonsatoya, hello everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here to speak with you. I wanna thank all of you who've tuned in from home. Thank you for joining and Inclusion Alberta. Thank you so much for all the work that you've done throughout the past few decades. Uh, over 30 years ago, I graduated from Mount Royal as a rehabilitation practitioner. And I started working in the classrooms in Morley, Alberta. And then I adopted my first son and he is complex needs, FASD. And really that was, you know, aside from studying and learning at Mount Royal University, around children with developmental disabilities, uh, and raising a family with children with developmental disabilities. After I adopted Stefan, then I adopted Amy and Sage, and I had two children of my own. And uh, when you have children with complex needs and developmental disabilities, social emotional disabilities, you know, the struggle starts right from the womb to, to the very end. And, you know, you're looking at housing issues, education, social and the the supports have slowly eroded over time and you know I remember in the 80s and 90s when PDD was thriving and you know we were transferring folks out of Michener Place and I mean there's just been so much movement in the uh, disability sector we need to keep building on that we need to keep empowering and you know really looking at how do we do inclusivity so that people's quality of life is the best it can possibly be. So thank you so much for having me here and I look forward to answering your questions as best I can. Thanks Jody, and thanks to all the candidates. We're now going to redirect to the questions. The theme of the first questions is access and funding for the persons with developmental disabilities program and family support for children with disabilities. The next question will be answered by the UCP first, the written response, and the NDP second. And the question comes from Kim Fox in Red Deer, and it is, multiple government reports have quoted families and individuals with development disabilities as saying PDD and FSCD are failing them. Government's open data shows that the number of individuals and families waiting for the supports they need has grown to thousands. Across Alberta, individuals and families continue to have their supports arbitrarily reduced or to be altogether denied support. The culture of these programs has deteriorated so much over the past decade that government's frontline representatives in these programs no longer treat families and individuals with respect and trust. 
What will your party do to restore these programs to their past status of being sustainably funded, supportive, and respectful in their response to families and individuals? I have the UCP's party answer to this, and then we'll hear from the NDP. And we'll employ the two minute time limit for this written response as well. The UCP says, multiple government reports have quoted families and individuals with development disabilities as saying PDD and FSCD are failing them. Government's open data shows that the number of individuals and families waiting for the supports they need has grown to thousands. Now, I think we've got the same question here. Oh, sorry, sorry, that's that I, I began with the question again. My sorry, my apologies. The response is our government cares deeply about supporting individuals with disabilities. That's why we have taken significant action to improve services and supports. Our government heard about challenges being faced by Alberta's disability sector, and we listened. A recent increase in funding will improve wages for nearly 20,000 disability workers in the province. We have received numerous letters thanking our government for the focus we have on the disability sector. For example, Dale Cena, the founder of Alberta Disability Awareness and Action said, quote, after experiencing years of high turnover rates and going nearly a decade without a pay increase, the disability workers in Alberta are finally getting a raise. With this plan, the government will strengthen our sector and ensure better care for thousands of Albertans, unquote. We are investing $240 million into the PDD wait lists to ensure individuals get the services they need. In the last six months, we invested $600 million into the sector and have shown a deep commitment to the disability community. That's the statement from the UCP, and now we'll hear from the NDP. Um, thank you. So what I do know is there are large wait lists and they have been growing for years. And what I also learned in opposition is that information is a premium. And so what I learned is that there is not a lot of information available. As somebody alluded to earlier, the information even contained on the wait list, which isn't updated regularly, by the way, um, really describes people as not waiting, but in process or waiting for a plan or waiting for a signature. And that really doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't tell us the complexity of the need or how long or where in the province they are. So one of the first things we need to do is to understand the scope and the enormity of the need. And it is enormous. I understand that. So we need to understand both for PDD adult services and for FSD for children, where are we right now and what do we need to do? And let me just say, I am thankful that uh, the UCP did cho choose to make an investment, but you know what? It shouldn't be only when oil prices are over $100 a barrel that we finally say, yes, let's invest back in these services. So I think that that is also something we need to talk about. Now, once we understand the complexity and the enormity actually of the wait list, because that open data has not been updated very regularly, then we can understand the need and start to make those plans. And one of the things that we've agreed to do is there are some principles that we will use as we do the work that we need to do in this area. And one is around transparency and accountability. So setting goals that we can actually measure to work in collaboration with stakeholders um, and families, groups like Inclusion Alberta, and then to really look at um, sharing the progress that we're making with people. Because I think it is one thing to say, you know, we put this here, we put this there, we put 50 million here, but people need to understand we invested this money in this in this area, whether it's wait list or wherever it might be, and then to report also on the results from that investment. So that is just sort of the surface, but um, we will make some, some big progress. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. Next question answered by the NDP first, and this was submitted by an anonymous parent. I desperately need FSCD funded supports, but I can't afford the upfront out-of-pocket expenses. I just don't have the money. I'm told when my son is an adult, PDD provides families with an advance that is balanced out at the end of the year. I simply don't understand why two disability support programs in the same government department have such different rules. Why are families of children being made to suffer? I'm sure I'm not the only parent of a child with disabilities with a limited income. I feel like I'm being punished for not being well off. 
What if I happen to have more than one child with a disability? This has to change. Exactly what will you do if elected to ensure families who have limited incomes can access FSCD supports? NDP first. Thank you so much to that parent who submitted the question and I can relate to your frustration. As long as I can remember those two systems have operated in silos. And our job at government is to ensure that those, those systems start communicating with one another. So may it be a software system that looks at updating client information, a centralized system that would allow for continuity and care and informed information between the systems. We understand that uh, you know this FSCD program structure makes it very difficult for families. And it's wrong for these programs to be confusing. So we need to do better so that it's not as confusing. And I know what it's like to be out of money, uh, out of pocket, and that's not fair and that's not equitable service. Uh, we are committed to consulting on accessibility and the inclusion legislation. We have heard repeatedly, nothing about us without us, which means we are gonna co-design and continue to co-design um, for much stronger positive policy that will create better programming. Uh, we want to commit to plain language, people who answer the phones, easy digital access that is co-designed and co-created by folks with disabilities. We care about these things and we want to work with the community so that they're not silos, so that they do work together, so that children have continuous support and services they need as they become adults. That is necessary and that is the work we will do together. Thanks very much, Jody. And here is the written response from UCP. Again, our government cares deeply about supporting children living with disabilities. And we know how much families rely on support such as family supports for children th with disabilities. And we are providing and proud to be spending about $233 million in support of the families and children in Alberta that rely on FSCD. We took quick action to address the challenges in the FSCD program, which were ignored by the NDP while they were in government. We hired an additional 25 full-time employees to help address workload pressures and ensure better access for supports by families. We began working on a new approach that will streamline access for FSCD for families. This includes opening access to certain family support services without needing to wait for a full assessment. These supports might include medical appointment support, mileage and meals, counseling services for parents and children, respite support, clothing and footwear, up to $400 a year. The UCP made it easier for families to access supports as we decreased the online assessment questions and fields by 58%. Cutting red tape for families in need of support will ensure we have enough staff to provide services and by increasing wages for nearly 20,000 disability workers province-wide, we are ensuring every child with a disability receive top-notch care. And that is from the UCP. The next question will be answered by UCP first, and this comes from Chris McCord, who lives in Edmonton Gold Bar, and I believe we have this question on video.
Our apologies, we do not have that video. So again, this comes from Chris McCord in Edmonton. While PDD's new online application form might appear to provide a more accessible and transparent process, our application literally disappeared into a void. I was eventually told my son was eligible for a living situation I thought, he, I thought was well suited to his needs. After waiting another six months for PDD to set up the funding, I was suddenly told that option was no longer on the table. Instead of considering my request, the PDD worker said she had found a bed in a group home where my son could be placed far away from us and his community to live with no one he knew. To be honest, I was both angry and hurt. I felt threatened and felt my son's life and future were being threatened by someone who didn't even know him and who had no respect for him as an individual or for our choices. I held my ground, but not all the parents are in a position to do that. There has to be a better way. We should not have our government attempting to intimidate us and determine my son's future. How will you ensure the PDD program will listen to individuals and families, respect their choices, and not dictate what their lives should look like? And from the UCP, we have this statement. I agree this is unacceptable, and I would like to speak to Chris McCord so that we can get to the bottom of this. No parent should have to go through that. And that is the statement from UCP, and now we'll hear from the NDP. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, these are, there was multiple questions in there, Chris, that are really important and fundamental. Uh, to the commitment that we will make as a government to long-term solutions. We know there are improvements that need to be made. And when we are elected, we will look at the programs and use the work that we started in government over review and we will implement the changes. We wanna make sure that families can stay together, that families are supported, that individuals are part of a community, that they belong and that they are receiving what they need to be successful, thriving, healthy individuals. We are committed to consulting on the accessibility and inclusion, which will involve program and deliver, which will, sorry, will involve programming and program delivery. We commit to plain language, people who answer phones, easy digital access. I said that before and I'm gonna say it again because they really matter. We're gonna be there when you call. We're gonna show up when you invite us. We are going to listen and we are gonna co-design and co-develop the strategy forward so that it's accessible. We care about these things, we care about your families, and we are gonna do this work with you. Thank you again. The theme of the second set of questions is ensuring access and quality for inclusive education. The next question will be answered by the NDP first, and I invite Connie Wasano, a mother in Edmonton Ellerslie, to read her question. Connie? Hi hey guys, can you hear me? Okay, we're good. <laughs> um, I live in a community where the public school was ready to provide my child with developmental disabilities and inclusive education in a regular classroom with non-disabled peers with appropriate supports. However, I'm Catholic and want my child, as is true for other children, to receive an inclusive education in the Catholic school district but the Catholic district refuses to provide my child with an inclusive education and wants to segregate them. I get to decide the course of education for my child without disabilities, as does and should every parent, but suddenly my natural rights as a parent dissolve because one of my children's has a developmental disability. The Catholic district's resources and the skills of their teachers are no different than the public districts, so that isn't the reason Catholic school district is denying my choice. In my situation, it appears that the public district was willing to offer inclusive education and the Catholic district was not. But I know that in some communities, the reverse situation also exists. And in other communities, there's no school at all willing to include children with developmental disabilities. What will your party do to ensure parental choice is honored and the choice of inclusive education is not a game of chance that depends on your religion or where you live in the province? And the NDP? Uh, 
Oh, thank you. That's a really uh, tough situation to put you in because you're right there in the moment and you need, have a need for your child. They really can't wait for something in the future. Um, I, I totally agree with you that you should have access um, for your children where you are. Um, every parent really needs to be supported in making these decisions. And I really commend um, Inclusion Alberta for the work that you do in supporting families. Under the UCP cuts to the education system, including core and PUF funding programs, these decisions became even more difficult as there were fewer supports available. We commit to hiring 4,000 more teachers and 3,000 more support staff, including educational assistants. And our goal is to make edu our education system more accessible and inclusive. We're committed to consulting on accessibility and inclusion legislation, which will be the framework where we will be able to commit to working with you in, in if we form government so that you will have these choices throughout the education system. We should expect um, that we'll be hearing more um, on other supports for children, but in the meantime, um, these are the main things we'll be offering it are the new legislation for inclusion and dis disabilities and more staff so that they're, we're more able to offer these services to you. Thanks, Luann. And the written response from UCP, the UCP introduced a funding formula that provides maximum flexibility to school authorities to spend the allocated funding the way their best meets their local needs. We also have reaffirmed parents' rights to choose the education choice that best meets their child's unique needs. This is why the UCP believe it is critical that government support parents' choices so that they can choose the path that they feel will best help their children reach their full potential. Having a diversity of choices enriches our whole system. These choices include the public system as well as private, public charter, and independent schools. Again, we would be happy to work with Connie to ensure, ensure both her choice and her child's education potential are taken into account. And we are now on to question five, which will be answered by the UCP first. And due to the sensitive subject matter, the parents who submitted this question asked to remain anonymous. I have a child with disabilities who has difficulty communicating and can get frustrated. I live in fear every day they're in school that they might be locked in a seclusion room. This will traumatize her and me for that matter. Though there are some school districts in Alberta that have ended this practice, I live in a district where this practice continues. How can the solitary confinement of children with disabilities in school be allowed when today even prisons are restricted from using solitary confinement due to its harm? What is your party's position on mandating the replacement of this practice that is known to be ineffectual and harmful with proven strategies that are effective, positive, and supportive. And from the UCP, we have this statement. The safety and well being of all students is a top priority for the UCP government. Education Minister Adriana Lagrange had heard from stakeholders like the Alberta Teachers Association and the College of Alberta School Superintendents, school boards, teachers, administrators, and parents that a full ban of seclusion rooms limits a school's ability to protect the safety of everyone. Under the ministerial order signed in 2019, school divisions are required to regulate seclusion rooms and track data via a monthly report. The new standards for the use of seclusion rooms will help ensure all students, including students with disabilities, will continue to be supported positively and safely at school. And now the NDP. Um, thank you. This must be really heartbreaking to think about every day that your child might end up in a seclusion room. I, I can't imagine what that would be like. And I do know that in the in their healthcare system as well, um, 
tying people up or using varying other measures is is um, used more than it should be. Um, we're certainly going to be focusing on other measures, developing other measures that we know can be used um, in, in these situations. And one of the ways that we'll do that is by getting a lot more staff into our classrooms. That will be the focus so that we don't need to be going this route if we have staff that are there and can individualize care for each individual and their situation. My heart really breaks for you for this, and um, hopefully we'll soon be able to um, be in government and get moving on getting more teachers and assistants in the classroom. Thanks very much, Luann. The next question answered by the NDP first, and then the statement from UCP, and it comes from Ling Fan. And Ling is a parent in Calgary Bow who submitted the following question. My son has been receiving an inclusive education, but I am forced to live in a state of constant anxiety as I'm told every spring the next teacher or the next principal at the next school may not agree to continue his inclusive education and respect my wishes. This is an example of the fact that inclusive education is not about funding or class sizes, but whether my child is wanted, valued, and entitled to a quality education just like any other kid. What steps will your party be taking if you form the next government to hold districts accountable to respecting my right to choose and to ensure my child's inclusive education is secure? NDP first, please. Under the UCP, Albertans with disabilities have had to fight very hard to be heard and supported, and that is definitely not right. We are committed to making life better for people with disabilities and in creating a more inclusive province. We've committed to consulting in the development of an Accessibility and Inclusion Act, which does have accountability built into it. This will include a comprehensive list of actions and will, will really embed disability considerations across all programs. It will identify the investments that need to be made to drive change in across all areas of disability. We look forward to consulting with you to ensure that these issues don't continue. I've certainly seen that in many other areas besides education, it can be a day-to-day -day thing who's looking after your family member. And we need to be able to have that stability. And I think that that voice for having that stability is really important and needs to come forward from you in these con consultations. Thank you very much once again. And the statement from the UCP. The UCP government is committed to ensuring that the education system provides equal opportunities for all learners in Alberta. In budget 2022, we spent over $1.4 billion to support, support students with additional needs throughout their educational journey, from pre-kindergarten all the way through to grade 12. We are committed to funding students with diverse needs through program unit funding, specialized learning supports, severe disabilities funding, low incident supports and services, and specialized assessment grants, and we are always looking to address new and ongoing needs of all students. We were pleased to announce a significant increase to our LISS grants from $1.8 million to $5 million for the latest school year. Our government will always be here to support the needs of all students in Alberta. The UCP also introduced class complexity funding, $126 million over three years, so school authorities can add supports to complex classrooms and give students the focused time and attention they need. With this new funding, school authorities will be able to hire more teachers, more educational assistants, or increase their hours, provide more training opportunities for staff, and or hire specialists such as counselors, psychologists and interpreters who will help enhance the learning environment for both students and staff. 
indigenous children and adults with de developmental disabilities and their families, access to culturally relevant supports and resources. And that statement again from the UCP. Third theme of tonight's questions, access to culturally relevant supports and resources for Indigenous children and adults with development disabilities and their families. The next question will be answered by the UCP first, and I now invite Judy Mickelson, a grandmother in Maskawachis, Wetaskiwin, to read her question. And Judy, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. I believe you're muted there, Judy. Okay. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Please, Thank please, you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, given that the Blackfoot Confederacy has filed a uh, human, Canadian human rights complaint in response to systemic discrimination, whereby PDD supports are not provided to First Nations adults with developmental disabilities who live on the reserve, how will you work with First Nations to ensure PDD and FSCD are readily accessible on reserve for First Nations children and adults with developmental disabilities? Thanks so much for your question and your participation, Judy. And here is the statement from UCP first, responding to your question, and then we'll hear from the NDP. Budget 2023 shows how much we care for Alberta's disability community. We want to ensure all those living with disabilities are able to access the supports they need, including those living in Indigenous communities. Our UCP government had the opportunity to meet with the Federal Minister of Employment, Workforce and Disability Inclusion to discuss ways that those living on reserves with disabilities can better be supported. We have heard loud and clear the needs of Indigenous communities for better disability services. Given that this falls with federal jurisdiction, we are happy to advocate to the federal government on behalf of Indigenous peoples, and we invite the NDP to join us in that advocacy. For Alberta's government, we do provide family supports for children with disabilities to those living on reserves, and we will continue to work hard to make sure families are able to support their children living with disabilities. That from the UCP and now the NDP. Hi, hi, Judy. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, the Alberta NDP will respect Indigenous rights, consult meaningfully, and work to establish positive partnerships with the Indigenous peoples of Alberta. To support this, we will work with Indigenous partners to implement Reconciliation Commission recommendations around language and culture, child welfare, training, education, and resource partnerships. We will work with our Indigenous partners to PDD and FSCD and consult on the development of an Accessibility and Inclusion Act. Many First Nations communities have been forced to utilize the Jordan's principle due to the lack of resources, funding, and supports. Many First Nations communities have already created action plans and have reached out, but we're just not receiving the funding needed to provide these supports to families in need on reserve. NDP will work with our Indigenous communities to help close these gaps. Thank you very much. Uh, we are moving into a theme, expanding inclusive housing and ending institutionalization. Next question will be the answered by the NDP first, and this comes from Ben Rowley, a self-advocate in Lethbridge West, and he submitted this question. Ben asks, the provinces of BC, Saskatchewan, Ontario, New Brunswick, and Newfoundland and Labrador have closed their large institutions. Manitoba is in the process of closing its remaining institution and has just signed a major settlement to provide restitution to those who were institutionalized. Nova Scotia was recently ordered by the courts to end within five years the systemic discrimination of institutionalizing people with disabilities. These settlements and court decisions are a response to decades of international research that firmly establishes the harm caused by institutions. 
Alberta remains one of only two provinces in Canada without a commitment to closing its remaining institutions. What is your party's position on closing Alberta's remaining institutions and not funding any new ones and to providing appropriate supports to enable individuals with disabilities to live in community as full and equal members of our province? First up, NDP. Uh, thank you. Uh, so there are two questions there, one about inclusive housing and uh, the other about ending institutionalization. So first, let me say around inclusive housing, uh, we did release a housing paper. I don't have time to go into it. It is available for people to see um, just the investment that we will make. But again, I want to point to inclusion and accessibility legislation that will remove a lot of the questions and a lot of the battles that we seem to have when we're deciding about how to invest in housing going forward. This will no longer be a luxury. I like to have accessible housing for people with disabilities, but it will be legislated. As far as um, institutionalization, I do want to say during my time in opposition, every every time we had an opportunity to ask during budget estimates, we would ask about the zero intake policy for places like Mitchell Center, and we're assured that there was no more intake. Now, you might recall uh, during a PC era, there was another attempt to shut down Mitchell Center and move people out. Now, I don't think that was necessarily a bad idea. I think the way that it was done was dangerous as we had a lot of people ending up in long term care. At the time, I was a provider and did work with a number of families and individuals to make that transition to a community they'd never lived in. And, uh, you know, it was really challenging work, but I also saw that it was possible and it was actually kind of beautiful when you saw it happen. So I am not in any way supportive of creating more institutional beds or more institutional placements for people with disabilities, but I am about listening to what they want and to helping them create families and friends of families or communities of, of friends and new communities, if that is what they want. Now, um, yeah, anything that we do will be in consultation with the people that are receiving the services and the people that care about them, because none of this should be done by government alone. It should always be done in partnership, transparently, in collaboration with people that, that are not just experts, but are part of that person's life. So thank you. Thanks, Ben. Thanks very much, Marie. And from the UCP, we are investing $1 billion over the next three years to expand and operate affordable housing, and around 20% is going to accessible units. Just two weeks ago, we announced $2.1 million to renovate units, and some of those dollars went to accessible housing Calgary. We are committed as a government to individuals with disabilities improving income security and increasing employment opportunities. Okay, the final theme is improving income security and increasing employment opportunities. And the next question will be answered by the UCP first. And I invite Elaine Lupel, a mom in Calgary Fish Creek to read her question, Elaine. Oops, I think we need to pop off your mute button. Thank you. So uh, one cannot say that our society is inclusive until those with disabilities enjoy the same level of employment as those without disabilities. Our daughter would love to work. I want to know why the pub Alberta Public Service is not committed to being an inclusive employer of individuals with developmental disabilities, particularly when the business community, to whom I do not pay my taxes, has employed so many more individuals than the very government to which I do pay my taxes. Will your party take any action to ensure that your, I mean our public service, Alberta's largest employer, becomes the largest inclusive employer of people with developmental disabilities in the province. Elaine, thanks very much for jumping on and asking that question. Here is the answer from the UCP. In Alberta, everyone deserves an opportunity to succeed. That's why Alberta's government has partnered with the Technology North Corporation and provided them with nearly $500,000 as they support young Albertans living with autism spectrum disorder. 
This funding is being used to launch a pilot program to provide youth living with ASD training and work experience, which will prepare them for successful futures. Alberta at Work is a three-year initiative that invests $600 million to support access to training and career development opportunities while helping Albertans re-enter the workforce. Funding is invested directly to help Albertans connect with and sustain employment. With funding made available through Alberta at Work grants, Alberta's government is meeting the needs of Albertans, especially those living with ASD. The pilot project made possible through this funding is strengthening Alberta's digital workforce with training in junior software testing, document digitization, and data management. And now, please, the NDP. Don C. Elaine, thank you so much for your question. Uh, there needs to be more opportunities for Albertans with disabilities to work, and the government should be committed to making sure these public services are inclusive. And I'm so sorry to hear that under the UCP, Albertans with disabilities have had to fight to be heard and supported, and that's just not right. The Alberta NDP is committed to making life better for people with disabilities and a more inclusive province. An Alberta NDP government is committed to moving beyond one-off announcements about employment projects or grants to support one organization and a few people to making real structural changes and ultimately investments that will support long-term changes in unemployment numbers. We will lay the legislative and policy framework through accessibility and inclusion legislation, which we will consult with you on. And the areas will include built environment, communication, programming and delivery, employment and transportation. The Alberta NDP looks forward to consultations with you and, and with all Albertans in ensuring that this legislation is everything that it should be. Nothing for us without us. We believe in this. We are committed to consultations, engagements where possible, co-design of programs and policies, and we wanna start on the consultation of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question will be answered by the NDP first, and it comes from Bruce Uditsky, a dad in Edmonton White Mud and Emeritus CEO of Inclusion Alberta. Bruce, please proceed. Hi, thank you, and good evening, everyone. Um, uh, this is what I'm about to say is a bit unfair um, to the UCP because they're not here, but I'd like to say to the NDP candidates that have so graciously joined us this evening, I listened to each of you at the beginning uh, rather uh, eloquently, passionately, um, you know, uh, uniquely describe your interest in. Uh, and social justice issues. And I obviously really appreciate and believe it's necessary um, for consultation. But uh, with all due respect, um, we would really appreciate direct answers in action and not to be repeatedly told now, everything will be wrapped up in a magic accessibility and inclusion piece of legislation, um, which has, yet to be the case anywhere in the world. So if it's possible in the future to respond directly to what we're seeking and not expect us to put our hope and you know desperate needs in some universal magical piece of legislation that's gonna change the world, it would be most helpful to um, really get direct responses. So here's my question. Our son has benefited as have we because Inclusion Alberta was able to find him a great job and support him in his job. During the time he was employed, in which I can very proudly say he earned above minimum wage, he still continued to benefit from H as he could earn an income before there were any direct deductions, sorry, from H. His H was, H was naturally less but his overall income was more, and he was paying taxes, which he was quite proud of doing. However, as things go, he recently lost his job. And while we are now looking for another job, H requires him to apply for employment insurance. 
as is required for everyone who works. He and his employer did contribute to EI while he was working. And so he did earn this Canadian benefit. But ACE does not treat AEI as earned income. As a result, his basic ACE is now reduced dollar for dollar according to the EI amount he receives. I think anyone can see how patently unfair this is. We all want Albertans with disabilities to work to the degree possible. Or, sorry, Albertans with disabilities to work to the degree possible. But why would they do that when in the end they're going to be punished and treated as less entitled to the EI they earned than any other working Alberta? What will your party do to ensure our son and others who want to work and thus are required to contribute to EI to receive the benefit they so justly and rightly earned? Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. NDP. Thank you so much, Bruce. And, and you know, I am passionate about this. I just wanted to share that. And, and I'm so sorry to hear that, you know, under the UCP, Albertans on age have had their payment dates changed. They had their benefits de-indexed, and especially at a time where the cost of living has been skyrocketing. And I completely understand, you know, there continues to be flaws in the age system, and obviously those should be fixed. We understand that age and income support clawbacks, such as EI, spousal income, some employment earnings, federal disability benefit, when it arrives, we, we understand that this deepens poverty. And oftentimes there's people who, whose checks were late and, and there was problems with getting their payments, which only added to the struggles. So, you know, I, I, I am listening, I'm hearing people when I'm out there, I, I'm understanding what they are going through. And, and again, my own daughter, well, she's my niece, but she's my daughter and she's also on age. And I, I feel these struggles. They hit my household too. Um, and the NDP will index H to 2019, meaning an additional $135 per recipient and ensure it is always indexed to inflation and is committed to a comprehensive review of programs and supports to ensure that they meet the needs of Albertans. We have committed to consulting on an accessibility and inclusion act. Yes, I get it that this act isn't going to be the be all end all but we've included a comprehensive whole of government approach to disability and inclusion to help embed disability con considerations across the programs while identifying investment in key areas to drive real change. The Alberta NDP looks forward to consultations with everybody on this, ensuring that the legislation is everything that it should be. And you can also expect to see some of the items in the platform That is our two minute time limit, uh, sternly invoked here at headquarters and the response from UCP in the written format. Once again, we support individuals with disabilities full stop. That's why the UCP government invested $600 million into the file in the last six months. We also re-indexed AISH payments and provided $600 in affordability payments. Happy to look into this further Thank you. And Bruce, you would think that uh, as long as you have been around and I've been around and, and uh, with your legendary work, I, I could have said Emeritus CEO and got your, your title correct and uh, great to reconnect, albeit virtually. That was our final question. We want to thank all the candidates for the responses. I'm going to invite each one of them for a closing statement, and if they choose to, uh, in reverse order from the opening statement. So we will begin with Jody Callahoo Stonehouse. Thank you so much, all of you, for your really important questions. Uh, it's very evident and clear that we support you, we care about you, and we wanna make sure that your children and your families are as successful as possible and we are committed to doing that work. So thank you so much for joining us and for your really important questions. Thanks, Jody. And up north to Kevin McLean. 
Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, this was really a, a real good learning session for me. I don't know if I said it before, I'm running for the Alberta NDP in the city of Grand Prairie and hoping to change it here. Uh, I'm anxious from children to adulthood that we've seen in our life and uh, from Grand Prairie communities that live far away and the travels they have to go to Edmonton because we don't have certain doctors in our community. Uh, income cutoff is low, we have to look at that. Uh, requests dropped are dropped. Uh, on the education front, let's be honest, we're gonna start doing a lot more of that for youth. But I'll hit back to Aish um, for uh, people that are adults or development disabilities. Um, we never de-index because of oil going down. What a disgrace. Uh, keep it with inflation. And I believe the caseworker, sometimes they don't want the numbers on it. They reduce the case. And they need to properly be transparent and saying how the program is and make it work better for the communities. We've got to do better. Thanks very much, Kevin. In Musquachi, Swatasquin, Catherine Swampy. Thank you all so much for inviting us to be a part of this. And thank you so much for joining and, and hearing what we had to say. Um, we really are committed to reducing the poverty among uh, the Albertans altogether, but particularly to our disabled Albertans and going around our province and, and really trying to make a difference in people's lives. It has been a very very long struggle and fight for us to get this far and we're really hoping that we can take all of these these recommendations and questions to the uh, legislature and really make a difference in in our real lives here so thank you all so much uh thank you catherine and marie renault in st albert okay Thank you. Um, first of all, I just appreciate um, Bruce Tudisky's comments about this legislation not being uh, magic. He's quite right. There is no piece of legislation that is magic, but I believe uh, really good legislation can change the landscape. And at the end of the day, we want to be elected as legislators. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't do important work while we're creating a really important legislative framework that will identify what we want to see in Alberta in terms of accessibility and inclusion. And believe me, there are many, many people and organizations that have a lot of visions of what they would like to see. And I'm really eager for an NDP government to start those conversations. I and my colleagues believe there's a better way. I believe that we can build a better future. I absolutely believe it for people with disabilities in Alberta and their families. And I'm ready to get to work and make some big changes because we've been watching broken systems for a long time. Let's end that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Marie. And down to Calgary for our last two closing comments. Uh, Justin Hughesby from Calgary Varsity. Hi, um, th thank you again. Uh, I actually feel uh, really appreciative to be able to uh, be here today, a little bit more on the fly on the wall, uh, if, if you will. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's really important to understand that, uh, uh, that I hope everyone understands that, uh, you know, we do hope uh, and, and care. We uh, are supportive uh, in, the, in the endeavor to sort of reduce, to, to reduce poverty uh, uh, reductions and make a difference. We're rooting for the successes of uh of everyone including uh, uh those with uh, uh persons with developmental disabilities as well as uh children and uh, and, and the families of children with that um you know i've learned more today uh uh and then i must have six or seven pages worth of notes here and i guess what i want to know is that uh, you also know is that uh you know respect uh you and respect and let you know that i do hear you and i look forward to working with you uh when we form government uh because i'm eager to make differences uh that for the programs that uh, you need thank you thanks very much justin and just across the city in calgary southeast luann metz to wrap things up hi Hello. Hi, I'm from Calgary Varsity and Justin is from uh, Calgary Southeast, but um, apologies. No, no problem. Um, so I, I really learned a lot from from all of the discussion and the questions today. And I really look forward to working with all of you on what we can do to improve things for children and adults with developmental disabilities, as well as people with all disabilities. It is a major goal. And I really am sorry we can't specifically answer your questions um, to make con really concrete promises like you would 
like to hear. Um, but we do know that the things that we have planned will make things better. And we want to keep hearing of all of the specifics of what you need and keep up doing what you're doing. Thanks very much, Luann. Uh, no intent to get you moving across the city to a new riding there. My apologies. Uh, thank you to all the candidates for all the responses. And everybody will be emailed a link with the recording of this event so that you can share it with your friends. And take a minute to complete the evaluation, please, to let Inclusion Alberta know whether this forum was helpful and any suggestions for improving things moving forward. And I'd like to just take a, a brief minute to thank everybody for their patience as we are juggling papers here at headquarters. Uh, but, you know, I really did enjoy hearing the comments and gaining insights to what is a complex and emotional uh, challenge in front of us. And uh, uh, it's incumbent upon all of us to, to take care of everybody in this province. So. Thanks again, and now invite Inclusion Alberta's President, Monica Bratt, to offer some closing words. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I just want to say the fact that six candidates joined us to talk about issues that are important to people with developmental disabilities and their families demonstrates that we can have an influence when we join our voices together as individuals with developmental disabilities, families, and allies. Conversations like what you've heard tonight have been happening right across Alberta, as many of you have gone to meet with your MLA, MLA local candidates. If you haven't already done so, please contact your local candidates from both major parties and take time to tell them your story and why it's important that they take action to improve the lives of individuals in development with, with developmental disabilities and their families. Please visit Inclusion Alberta's website to learn about the issues we feel are most important to raise, what you can do to make a difference, and to hear from families that have experience meeting with elected representatives. We'll post a recording of tonight's event, and we have fact sheets you can use in your meetings with candidates, as well as guidance on how and where to meet with your MLA candidates and information about how to vote. Thank you so much to Marie Renault. Luann Metz, Jody Callahoo Stonehouse, and Catherine Swampy for your thoughtful responses and for your commitment to talk, talking about these issues. Thanks also to Kevin McLean and Justin Hughesby for taking the time out of your busy campaign to be here to learn about these issues. Regardless of the outcomes of the election on May 29th, Inclusion Alberta looks forward to continuing a relationship with each of you because of your leadership in your communities and in our province. Finally, I would like to thank Steve Hogel, who moderated this event with such professionalism. Thank you, Steve, for supporting Inclusion Alberta's work by volunteering your time. This concludes our event. Um, hope everybody has a good evening and thank you for coming out tonight.